Hello, everybody. It looks like it is officially noon mountain time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Recovery is Health, Health is Recovery Lunch and Learn series. My name is Randy Pedersen. I'm the Syringe Exchange Program Manager at the Division of Public Health at the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare and an all-around harm reductionist advocate for some of the discussion that will be happening today. I'm excited that you've joined us. And as many of you know, September is National Recovery Month. This year, partners at the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, Recovery Idaho, Idaho Harm Reduction Project and the Northwest ATTC are collaborating to provide this Lunch and Learn series focused on health topics in recovery. So over the course of this six session series, we'll discuss topics such as harm reduction, prevention and treatment, and or infection prevention and treatment and smoking cessation. So these sessions will be held every Wednesday and Thursday throughout September. And just a few housekeeping items before we introduce our wonderful speaker today. I certainly encourage you to introduce yourself to your peers in the chat to help kind of foster a sense of community amongst us that are attending this learning series. And we will have a question and answer session or uh, section at the end of this session. Um, so if you do have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to add those to the chat or you can ask them here towards the end. And you certainly can choose to send questions privately to, to the host and the panelists if you would prefer. So a recording and slides from today will be available on the Northwest ATTC website shortly after this session. And if you attend the live session today, you will receive a survey requesting your feedback and a certificate that you can use to obtain continu continuing education credit. So today is part three, and we will discuss viral hepatitis. We're joined by Danae Schoborn. She's a health program specialist for the Viral Hepatitis Prevention Program at the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, a colleague of mine um, that I enjoy immensely. She is very passionate for health, and um, early on in her life, she really realized that health plays an important role in our overall happiness and well-being, and she's very passionate about viral hepatitis and excited to share with you today. So, Danae, I will hand, hand it over to you. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to say hi and welcome everybody today today's session and I'm so thankful to have you here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides with you and present information about viral hepatitis. So thank you. All right. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Danae um, Schoenborn, and I'm the Health Program Specialist for the Viral Hepatitis Prevention Program with Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. The Viral Hepatitis Prevention Program is within the Bureau of Clinical and Preventative Services, HIV, STD, and Hepatitis Section. Um, I am excited to be a part of Recovery Month, focusing on health and sharing information about my program with all of you today. So today's agenda is we're gonna talk about the Idaho Viral Hepatitis Prevention Program and share information about what I do and what's going on in Idaho concerning viral hepatitis. And then um, we'll talk about Idaho, or we'll talk about hepatitis information and liver health. We're gonna focus on hepatitis A, B, and C today. And then we'll talk and share um, a little bit about Idaho Hepatitis C awareness campaigns and what we have going on throughout the state. And then we'll have a group discussion, the Q&A. And I'd also really love to hear what you guys are doing in your states if you feel comfortable in sharing. Um, it's always great to learn from each other and learn what each other are doing in each, in each state. So Idaho Viral Hepatitis Prevention Program, our, our vision is partnering with the community to create a region in which hepatitis is transmission, or transmission is halted, testing is accessible, and all people have access to affordable evidence-based treatment. Now, our mission is to prevent further viral hepatitis transmission to reduce disability and mortality, as well as improve the quality of health and well-being for Idahoans. So this mission and vision was created by our stakeholder meeting. So a group of us have got together with our elimination planning efforts, and we created this vision and mission for Idaho. Now today I'd like to share a little bit of information about the timeline and what viral hepatitis 
um, prevention program look like in Idaho? So prior to 2017, we only had $20,000 in Idaho to conduct surveillance planning and prevention activities and strategies. So as you can see here, $20,000 isn't a lot of money and it doesn't stretch very far. However, in 2017, um, we had an increase of funding to $65,350. We had a new focus and that was on persons born between 1945 to 1965, so our baby boomer population. And this is where we had our first set of grants that we had information um, focusing on hepatitis C testing and treatment. Then in 2018, we had increased funding to $115,000. We held our first stakeholder meetings, and then we had two additional subgrants where we wanted to increase hepatitis C testing and treatment. Then in 2019, we held two more stakeholder meetings and two disease progression models, um, one for hepatitis B and one for hepatitis C was developed and then the syringe exchange program was legalized. Then in 2020, as we all know, um, things got put on hold, our programs and perhaps maybe even our personal lives due to COVID-19. And then in 2021, which was amazing, we had a new grant, we had an increase of grant funding. We had a new focus to focus on surveillance activities and elimination planning and prevention strategies. And this is where actually the viral hepatitis prevention program for the very first time had a full-time person conducting prevention strategies and activities. Um, I was hired at the end of November and then since January of 2021, we've had stakeholder meetings um, every month since January. We have a smaller work group that's been formed, um, focusing on elimination planning and activities and strat strategies. We also support Project Echo Liver Care Series, where we have subject matter experts meet with providers across the state that meet twice, um, just online via Zoom, um, every second and fourth Monday of the month from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Um, providing education and information and, and just helping those primary care providers being able to treat hepatitis C. And then between 21 different organizations, we have MOU, so Memorandum of Understandings, or a subgrant in place where we focus on hepatitis C testing and treatment services. So this is where we are at today with viral hepatitis. I'm so excited to see that progress of where we've come and I'm excited to see where we're headed and where we're going now that we have more funding and a full-time person, we're able to do a lot more. So since we had increased funding and prevention activities and um, activities and strategies, this is all in response to the World Health Glo um, Organization's global guidance. So in 2016, the World Health Organization's global guidance to eliminate viral hepatitis, the threat of it by 2030, per these benchmarks, so a 90% diagnosis of all infection, an 80% reduction in new infection, and a 65% reduction, uh, reduction in liver-related mortality. So um, having this increased funding and these prevention activities and strategies is in response to the World Health Organization plan um, and global guidance to eliminate viral hepatitis. Now, the World Health Organization Director General said that hepatitis is one of the most devastating diseases on earth, but it's also one of the most preventable and treatable with services that can be delivered easily and cheaply at the primary health care level. So expanding further on that, hepatitis A and B are preventable by vaccines. At this time, there is not a vaccine for hepatitis C. However, hepatitis C can be cured with a short course of treatment, just eight to 12 weeks with little to no side effects. And there's between a 95 to a 98% cure rate. So the Viral Hepatitis Prevention Program in Idaho is a five-year grant with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The two components are, um, we have component one, which is surveillance activities and component two, focusing on those prevention strategies. We really wanna have an understanding in the state of Idaho, what does um, viral hepatitis look like in Idaho? So we wanna increase and improve that surveillance of hepatitis A, B, and C. We, and that just includes outbreak detection and investigation and control. And then I work on prevention strategies and this is where we support that viral hepatitis elimination planning. So any state that partakes in um, CDC funding is required to do the elimination planning efforts for their state. So that's what we're working on now. And then we want to increase access to hepatitis B and C testing and treatment. So our overall plan and goal for Idaho is we want to build state and local capacity 
really addressing those barriers that individuals face when they seek testing and treatment, reducing that um, stigma and discri discrimination. We also want to increase the number of clinics that offer hepatitis C testing, along with those providers willing to provide treatment. And that's where ECHO Idaho series comes in and really mentoring those primary care providers. We want to continue our statewide education and outreach level um, activities, really raising that awareness about hepatitis can be cured, and then continue those elimination planning efforts and working with our technical advisory committee. Now, a part of that elimination planning effort, we do work with a technical advisory committee. I've been speaking about that. And so you guys might be wondering, who are these people? Who, what does this committee consist of? And it, it's our health system. So it's our healthcare providers. Idaho Medicaid contributes to this um, stakeholder meeting. We have Boise VA. We have representatives from Idaho um, Pharmacy, College of Pharmacy. We have pharmacists across the state that participate because they help um, to treat hepatitis C. We have our public health, so our public health departments, my colleagues in safer syringe programs, the HIV program and STD program. We have Idaho Department Corrections, which is an, an incredible partner that continue to meet with us and we are so thankful for that partnership. We have probation and parole. We have people from the reentry program. We have Recovery Idaho, um, our recovery community, North Idaho AIDS Coalition and Idaho Harm, Re um, um, Harm Reduction Project. So. We're excited to have these amazing, tremendous individuals that contribute to this elimination planning effort and are just as passionate about viral hepatitis as um, I am. So I'm thankful to have this group. Now, what this group, what we endeavor to do is we want to reduce transmission hepatitis viruses through preven prevention and education efforts. So we really want to educate Idahoans. We want to provide up-to-date information for those at risk for contracting viral hepatitis, we want to provide up-to-date information to doctors and pharmacists and clinicians. This is through Project ECHO. Um, people that serve Idahoans at risk for contracting viral hepatitis, we want to provide information about how to decrease risk factors associated with transmission. We want to utilize resources and professional collaborations to create that proactive plan that destigmatizes um, hepatitis. And most importantly, this is the thing I'm most passionate about, is empowering people living with hepatitis C to um, be aware of their infection status, so um, get testing, and if they are have an active infection, to seek care. We want to make sure that we're advocates, that we're helping people understand that there is a cure for hepatitis C, and that there are people out there, there are organizations that are able to treat and provide that care. And then we want to help community, community agencies provide respectful, compassionate, comprehensive, and evidence-based treatments. So that's where our goal is, and that's what we hope to do for Idaho. So um, what is hepatitis? Well, hepatitis is inflammation or swelling of the liver. This is most often caused by a virus. However, other um, causes of hepatitis can uh, include toxins, heavy alcohol use, um, certain medications, or certain medical conditions. Now, when we're talking about our hepatitis elimination planning efforts, we're really focusing on that hepatitis B and hepatitis C because that is the leading cause of liver cancer, liver transplant, and um, hepatitis-related deaths, so that premature death. So we really focus on those two. In Idaho, chronic liver disease or cirrhosis, so that scarring of the liver, is the 10th leading cause of death. And so that's 16 deaths per 100,000 or in 2020, that was 322 deaths that were reported. Now, liver disease in the United States in 2020, there were 4.5 million adults diagnosed with liver disease. Um, there was 51,642 deaths, and that was about 15.7 per 100,000. So as we're talking about this, um, for this discussion, we're just gonna focus on hepatitis A, B, and C, really honing in on B and C. However, worldwide, globally, scientists have identified five unique hepatitis viruses. So in addition to um, hepatitis A, B, and C, there are D and E. We won't be discussing that today. Um, why, is, why are we talking about this? And most importantly, why is this important? Well, since Recovery Month is focusing on health and how important our health is to our body so that we can function and live these full, amazing, progressive lives, um, our liver is our second lar largest organ in the body and our liver does amazing things for our body. And so hepatitis does impact our liver. 
Our liver cleans our blood of toxins. It gives us energy. And frankly, I always need more energy. And I don't know about you guys, but I think we all need more energy. So thank you, liver, for our energy. Um, our liver helps aid in digestion, and it processes what we eat and drink into nutrients that our body utilizes, and it filters out harmful substances for our blood. So it's important, especially that we're focusing on health, to make sure that we focus on the health of our liver and protect our liver health. So moving on, what are symptoms of viral hepatitis? Well, if you look on the CDC website, hepatitis A, B, and C all have similar symptoms. So it's that yellowing of the skin and eyes. So I don't know about you, but little babies can typically, typically have that jaundice. I know my kiddos, um, when they were younger, they had that jaundice. And so that's a really telltale sign of an adult or somebody has that yellowing skin and eyes. That's a, a sign to meet with your primary care provider. Um, other symptoms include fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dark pee, pal poop, stomach pain, tiredness, lack of ap appetite, and you can have the um, itchiness of skin. So if you are experiencing any of this, it's so important to consult with your healthcare provider. So what should we know about hepatitis A? Well, hepatitis A is found in the stool and blood of people that are infected. It's highly contagious um, and people can spread it without even feeling sick. There's that person to person contact. So sexual contact, caring for someone who is ear ill, sharing drug equipment, that um, eating contaminated food or drinks so they eat um, fecal oral route, and our national impact. So in 2018, there were 12,474 cases in the United States. But as you're going to see through this presentation, all of the viral hepatitis are underreported. Um, and, and hepatitis A is no different. And so due to underreporting, they think that those that caseload is higher. So the 24,900. In 2016, cases highly um, dramatically increased from those large person-to-person -person outbreaks that were occurring. Um, since hepatitis A vaccine was first recommended in 1996, cases have dr um, dramatically declined. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm one of these people that I kind of like to know interesting facts. And so I just have kind of put this on each of our slides. So this was an interesting fact to me. And, and it's the did you know type theme. And, and it, did you know that hepatitis A can live outside the body? for months, depending on environmental conditions. And I thought that's so interesting. And so we'll have a few more of those that you're gonna see and you're gonna realize, oh, she must really like these interesting facts. <laughs> All right. So for prevention, the really great thing is hepatitis A can be prevented by vaccine. So um, children require two doses, six months apart. That first dose can be administered at one year of age. Um, there's two types of vaccines for adults. There's that single dose again, um, that can be given in two shots six months apart. And then there's that combination of hepatitis A and B that's the combination. Um, hepatitis A does not become chronic and long-term. That's why when I mentioned earlier, when we're focusing on these elimination strategies for Idaho, really just focusing on B and C because B and C are long-term. Um, a is not chronic or a long-term infection. And so hepatitis A antibodies can appear early in the course of infection. They do provide lifelong protection. Um, symptoms usually last less than two months. However, there's that really small portion of people that can have prolonged relapsing systems, um, symptoms for up to six months. So moving on to hepatitis B, what should we know? Well, hepatitis B can be transmitted through bodily fluids and routes of transmission are um, infected pregnant person um, to child during birth, um, sexual contact from infected partners, that direct direct contact from um, infected blood and shared uh, drug equipment. Now between 880,000 to 1.89 million people are living with hepatitis B, and so two-thirds may not know that they're aware, um, oftentimes because they may not have symptoms. So hepatitis B can be a lifelong infection where you have that cirrhosis, that scarring of the liver, which makes it hard for your um, liver to function properly. You can have liver cancer and premature death. Now here's another interesting fact for you all is hepatitis B can survive outside the body and can remain infectious for at least seven days. So for prevention um, in children, it's preventable by vaccination. Um, in children, they receive three doses, that first dose at birth, second um, one to two months, and then that third dose at six to eight months. Adults can receive um, varying doses, so they can receive a two-dose series, a three-dose series, or a four-dose series, and that's really just depending on the manufacturer um, and, and 
the condition and just discuss with your healthcare provider. I had an individual ask me, well, what about boosters a while back? Um, do you need boosters if you were vaccinated? And um, per the CDC website, if you've been vaccinated and you are a person of no normal immune status um, who has been vaccinated, um, you do not need a booster. It's not necessarily recommended. However, you could always speak with your healthcare provider to provide that guidance for you. Um, there isn't a cure for hepatitis B. So that's really important to note to remind people that there is no cure. Um, people with chronic long-term infection need to be evaluated for liver problems and monitored on a regular basis. Now there are treatments that can help um, that are available that slow down that pre and prevent the effects of liver disease, but it isn't cured. Um, some people, especially adults, are able to clear the virus and people who clear that virus become immune and they cannot um, be reinfected with the hepatitis uh, B virus again. Now, this is an interesting fact. 90% of infants infected with hepatitis B will develop um, chronic infection. This is in contrast to 5% of adults will develop hepatitis B. So all of this information is found on the CDC. And when I share these slides, the source and the places that I got this information are all hyperlinked for you. So it'll take you right to those sources for you to look up this information as well. So hepatitis C is spread when someone comes into contact with blood from an infected person. Now this can happen through shared needle, needles, syringes, and other equipment used to prepare and inject drugs. Hepatitis C can also be transmitted from a pregnant person during childbirth. Um, and the, while this is less common, it can be spread sexually as well from infected partners. Um, however, that's less common. So in the United States, there are around 2.4 million people living with hepatitis C. Many are unaware. So that's why testing is key. And that's why we're, we're increasing those testing efforts all throughout Idaho. Um, at least 50% of people living with hepatitis C are not aware of their infection status. It's known as the silent epidemic. Now, in April of 2020, the CDC updated and expanded their hepatitis C recommendations for universal screening for all adults 18 years of age and older at least once in a lifetime. And then every pregnant person during each pregnancy should be tested. And now this is another interesting fact per this um, CDC website is hepatitis C is 10 times more infectious than HIV. Now, hepatitis C is on the rise in the United States with 63% of new infections occurring among um, people ages 20 to 39. And you can see that I showed, I provided these graphs on the site. So um, acute cases, that's considered new, new cases. Um, and in the United States, you can see in that 20 to 39 group, the, you see that increase of hepatitis C new cases. And then we see that similar um, in Idaho. So if you're looking down in the Idaho bar graph, that 20 to 39 group has those higher um, rates of new infection in that age group. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, most people become infected with hepatitis C by sharing needles, syringes, and any other drug equipment used to prepare and inject drugs. And per CDC, hepatitis C can live on dry surfaces and equipment for up to six weeks, resulting in longer period for potential transmission than for other bloodborne pathogens pathogens. So now I wanted to take you through the timeline for hepatitis C treatment. Um, this is something as we're, we're working on that elimination planning efforts and we're working with different groups. That is one thing that it's discussed about is that treatment, that there might be people that may be not aware that hepatitis C can be cured and that if it can be cured, they may have heard information of, of past experiences and how hard um, it was to cure hepatitis C. So in late 1989, early 1990s, the first hepatitis C treatment um, was available. And what it was, it was a protein-based injection and it was called recumbent interferon alpha. And what this did is it mobilized the body's immune system to fight the disease. However, it, would, it could take anywhere from six months to a year for treatment and it was injections, right? And there was a low cure rate, so between 6 to 16% cure rate, which is really low. The one thing about this, though, is the side effects were horrible. So you have this year-long treatment, you have these injections, there was a low cure rate, you had hair loss, you could experience hair loss, there was severe depression, vomiting, suicidal thoughts, liver damage, and I want to express liver damage. So this actual treatment could cause liver damage, 
which is what we were trying to, um, that's why we want to treat hepatitis C to prevent liver damage. It could cause um, autoimmune diseases, increased infections, and stroke. Now, in 1995, scientists discovered that if you mix this, inter this injectable interferon with an anti-viral um, medication, ribavirin, that you had better cure rate, right? Um, however, it was still a year-long treatment, so you would have to do those injections plus that oral medication. However, the cure rate was between 33 and 41 percent, but that's still under 50 percent. You're going to experience the same side effects from that interferon plus um, side effects from the ribavirin, so uh, thyroid issues, psychosis, anemia, flu-like symptoms, insomnia, hair loss. So as you can tell that this is pretty hard on the body and that cure rate is pretty low. It's not even 50%. Then in 2002, there was a breakthrough, by the way, of pegylated interferons. So that was fewer injections. You had less side effects and a higher cure rate. Now, if you um, added the pegylated interferon with the RBV, so the ribavirin, um, you had a greater success rate. So that was between 54 to 56, so about ha um, half cure rate. So that's better. And then in 2011, the FDA approved two, the first two protease inhibitors used in combination with the pegulated inferon and RBV. You had a higher cure rate of 66 to 79%, but the negative side effects and interactions with other drugs outweighed those benefits. So as you can see up to that point, it was, it was pretty, we had some, some hard times of trying to cure hepatitis C. Then in 2012, Clinical trials began for this new class of medications, direct acting antiviral oral medication. So prior to 2013, hepatitis C was difficult to treat, side effects were horrible, but with this new class of medication, these direct acting antivirals, which is just an oral medication, no, no um, injection, just only the oral medication, you had higher rates to cure hepatitis C of 95 to 98%, so almost 100% cure rate with a little to no side effects, that's so important to note, and it was only eight to 12 weeks um, for treatment. So this is like amazing for hepatitis C and what a huge breakthrough. So it's important for us to understand how far we come medically for hepatitis C. However, um, people are still not receiving that treatment. So in August 9th, the CDC released, released this press release that indicated um, we still have area for improvement. Individuals are still not seeing, um, receiving that treatment for hepatitis C. So less than a third of people diagnosed with hepatitis C are receiving that timely treatment for this deadly yet curable infection. According to the report, treatments lowest among people who are in state administered programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Only one in four Medicaid recipients are receiving treatment within that first year. Um, the CDC also reported that the highest rates of new infection are among those adults under 40, which we, we talked about earlier in this presentation, and new analysis found that, that they're the lowest in receiving um, treatment rates. So that's a group that we really need to focus on receiving treatment. However, there's still a lot of barriers. So the CDC and policymakers are calling on um, policymakers to remove those eligibilities and restrictions and pre-authorization requirements to, that make it really difficult for people to receive treatment. They want to expand the number of primary care providers receiving hepatitis C treatment. So instead of just relying on those specialists, let's have those primary care providers treat hepatitis C. And then there's some other things that we can look at doing maybe uh, providing treatment where people already are, where they already receive services like our community-based clinics, possibly our syringe service programs, maybe our substance abuse treatment centers, and try to provide treatment in as few visits as possible. So this is something that I wanted to note because I'm really proud of Idaho Medicaid. So the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable launched their hepatitis C state of Medicaid access where they evaluated all states, um, uh, state of Medicaid, their Medicaid programs um, for hepatitis C treatment and how people are receiving those treatments. Now in Idaho, we received an A plus, which means we eliminated these restrictions for people receiving treatment. So, Anybody that's receiving um, Idaho Medicaid is eligible to receive treatment, and there are no restrictions, which is awesome. It's fantastic. Now, you might be wondering, well, what are these evaluation grades? What's this criteria? What was it based on? Well, it was some states um, restrict hepatitis C treatment based on fibrosis restrictions. So maybe people that have a more uh, severe liver disease are, will receive treatment versus somebody that may not. 
So they might have that active infection, but if their liver is healthy, they may not receive um, treatment. Some states restrict on substance use. So if there's people that are using any type of substance, whether it's alcohol or any other type of substance, they may not receive treatment. Um, there can be prescriber restrictions in other states, meaning primary care providers might not have the ability to prescribe without meeting with a specialist first and reviewing the case. And then there's re-treatment restrictions. So anybody that re may have received a treatment in the past and were reinfected, they may not be eligible for retreatment. So Idaho has been awesome. I wanna give Idaho a little shout out, maybe a little um, pump, a fist pump. They have done an amazing job in reducing all of those restrictions and giving us that A plus grade score. So that is awesome. Thank you, Idaho Medicaid. Hopefully if you're tuning in and you're from another state and your state has restrictions, maybe you can look at what Idaho is doing and, and bring this into your policymakers and see if we can work on restricting um, other Medicaid programs. So as I share all this information to you, I'm asking you today, uh, well, let's work together. So I've, I've provided this information and now it's our time for call to action. So what I'm asking is, is let's continue to spread that word and reduce stigma and dis discrimination because there is so much discrimination still surrounding viral hepatitis, although it's preventable, A and B is preventable, and there is a cure now for hepatitis C. So it's so important that we have that conversation. Um, if you're in another state, find local advocates in your community and continue to spread that word about viral hepatitis. The importance of getting tested is so important for people to know their infection status. And then reminding community members that hepatitis C can be cured, and not only that it can be cured, but the treatment is so much better than what it previously was. So I think that's a powerful story to share and let people know. Um, maybe you can get involved in your community somehow. Every May is Hepatitis Awareness Month and the CDC has amazing hepatitis awareness campaign materials that you can share in your communities, share at your work. And then you can also celebrate World Hepatitis Day, which is um, July 28th every month or every year it's July 28th. And maybe you could work in your communities, maybe the month of July, you have awareness campaigns and have, um, maybe you can work with your local health departments and you can offer hepatitis C testing. You can also join the conversation online and use your social media platform to share the information. Um, you can follow CDC HEP on Twitter and use that hashtag NoHepC to join that conversation. So it's important that we meet with our local advocates, we meet with our health departments and we continue to spread their word and reduce stigma surrounding viral hepatitis. It's important to empower community members to get tested, to know that there's treatment options and to be advocates for our community members. Now, if you're in an Idaho and you would love to participate in um, the hepatitis prevention elimination planning efforts, I would love to have you join us. My information is there on the screen. Please reach out to me because I would love to share that information. We meet monthly. And it's a good reminder together, we can make a difference. The more we talk, the more we share, the more kindness we have, the more compassion we have, um, we will make a difference in our community. So that's my call to you, my call to action. Um, now I would like to share our viral hepatitis awareness campaigns. So I've mentioned that awareness is so important to remind community members that hepatitis C can be cured. Um, my supervisor, Kimberly, and our Idaho Department of Health and Welfare graphic designer created these beautiful graphic art designs and we partnered with our transportation. Now, if you're in Idaho, if you're not from Idaho, I need to tell you that Idaho transportation is really sparse. It's hard to find communities that offer it. And even some offer it, they don't provide this bus route. So in the Treasure Valley, Boise area, we have partnered with Valley Regional Transit. We have 26 buses throughout the Treasure Valley. This began in 2021 and we renewed it in 2022. We just wanna remind those community members, have you heard Hep C can be, heard, uh, can be cured? And that call to action is call 211 or visit your provider. So we were excited to share that information. And then we were excited that we were able to expand this in Pocatello. So on the other side of the state, we have this in Pocatello Regional Transit. The only thing that different that we added is we do now have a vanity URL, which is findidahotesting.com. So if you were to just Google findidahotesting.com, you would see this um, 
prevention locator, service locator page. So really we want people to understand, number one, that hep C can be cured. Okay, well, they know that now. Now what do they do? Where do they find testing? Where do they find treatment? Well, if they go to findidahotesting.com, they can click in their zip code, um, click on hepatitis testing or hepatitis treatment, and a list of providers will pop up in their area. So this is so cool. The cool thing about this is it isn't just hepatitis. There's STD, HIV, information for our safer syringe programs, uh, so all of this amazing information lives in findidahotesting.com. Now, if you're in another state, this was so easy to create, and this is something that you could possibly create in your state um, because it's incredibly helpful and it's awesome to work. We're trying to get this in our um, probation and parole, so people that maybe um, are released from our Idaho Department of Corrections that didn't receive treatment before they were released, um, this is a great area for them when they're on probation and parole. We want to share this information so that they can find out where to get treated. So we're excited about our service locator page. Now, these are our rural buses. Um, so Pocatello Regional Transit, they have a city urban bus, and then we have two rural buses. Now, in Idaho, we have 44 counties. 35 of those are um, rural, considered rural counties, and 18 are frontier. And so we want to make sure that our rural community members understand and know that hepatitis C can be cured. And what can they do? Well, they can call 211 for action. They can talk to their provider and they can find um, testing. Now, when patrons see the outside of the bus, they're reminded as they go inside of the bus, we have posters on the inside of the bus with the same information, just providing them, just reminding them, visit findidahotesting.com, find your provider or call 211. This is our second version of our poster and our billboards were actually created after this. Um, we do have that findidahotesting.com, and we also have text HEP22999. Now, if you were to text HEP22999, you would go to our service locator page. So this is all information that is provided inside the bus as well. Now we have our billboard campaigns, and we wanted everything pretty streamlined. So you're seeing this on the buses. Now you're seeing this on our billboard campaigns. Um, we have billboards throughout the entire state. This billboard is in Homedale, Idaho, but we have billboards in Post Falls, Wallace, Coeur d'Alene, Lewiston, Caldwell, Boise, Twin Falls, and Idaho Falls area. Again, with that same information, the call to action, we want them to know that it can be cured and then the call to action, um, visit your doctor or visit findidahotesting.com. And then we have worked with another organization called Mesmerize to deliver hepatitis C posters and rat cards across the state throughout 335 locations. Those locations include our medical clinics, our pharmacies, our laundry mats, our food pantries, our food banks, our homeless shelters, um, with this information reminding people that it can be cured and what's that call to action? Um, visit findidahotesting.com or your provider. We also have these pharmacy bags in 84 pharmacies throughout the, state, throughout the state with the same information. So we really just want to streamline this information and really let Idahoans know how important this is and that it can be cured. So with that, I thank you so much for your time today, for allowing me to share um, viral hepatitis information and what we're doing in Idaho. Um, I would love any questions or answers that you have, and I would also love a discussion with you guys um, talking about what you're doing in your states as well, because I love to learn from each other. Awesome. Thanks so much, Janae. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to type that in the chat, come off mute. Um, love to um, hear from you. Danae, you were just so thorough, I think. <laughs> I'm so excited what we're doing in Idaho. And as, as everybody could see in that progression of what the viral hepatitis looked like in Idaho, starting out with $20,000 and where we are today, um, we're doing so much and it's just so exciting. Looks like there's a question in the chat. I'm not sure if Kayleen, if you wanna 
appreciate that or I can too for Denise. Yeah, Danae, um, mm -hmm. Tiffany asks, if you aren't sure if you were vaccinated, can you get the vaccine again? Yeah, per the CDC um, website, that is what they said. Um, if you weren't sure if you've been vaccinated and you don't have that information, that it definitely would not harm you to get vaccinated, but it's always important to talk with your primary care provider. So. I can also see that Cody Lewis raised their hand, but Cody, do you have a question? I think we can allow you to talk if you want. Oh, no, I don't. Okay, well, you're welcome. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear. I would love to hear what other states are doing. I know Washington is, has an amazing, um, program and they're doing so many wonderful things we look to our neighbors in washington all the time so we're thankful for that and if any other states know what they're doing i would love to hear what you're doing in your state Randy, I, I, or Randy, I have a question for you. Since you're the Safe Syringe Program Manager for Idaho, with that press release with the CDC that they came out last month and some of the recommendations they talked about, you know, possibly providing treatment in locations where people are already at. So substance use treatment centers, um, community-based organizations, safer syringe programs. What are your thoughts about that? And do you think that that's something that um, is viable and something that we can do? Yes. Yeah, I love that recommendation. I mean, I think I mean probably many of us know on this call that I think as as much as we can kind of co-locate services for folks, um, mm -hmm. the better. I think our healthcare system is really complicated. And when we try to refer people, um, especially folks that, you know, are maybe unstably housed or, you know, just have all of these complications in life, it just gets really hard to actually be able to follow through on those referrals sometimes. So mm -hmm. um, just even providing hep C treatment within, you know, your primary care provider's off office is amazing. Um, but yeah, I think that there's lots of opportunity to expand access in other touch points that, um, you know, people who may be infected may be going to regularly. SSPs is great. I think recovery centers would be wonderful um, or other substance use behavioral health treatment providers too. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, so with some of our subgrants that we're looking at is increasing those mobile units. So also trying to find people where they're at. So maybe if you're unable to provide treatment in your substance use treatment centers or um, safe service programs, maybe provide those mobile units. Maybe that's something that we can look at doing. I know um, with our FQHCs, those are really great places for people um, to, they have the ability to fill out paperwork with people or really having that understanding of, okay, if I don't even know where I'm going to sleep tonight, I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal. Am I really concerned about treatment? And so that's where a lot of these FQHCs have individuals like community health patient navigators that are helping people with, okay, let's get you in stable housing. Let's, let's find out how we can help get you um, so you're not food insecure. And so I think that's going to be so important as moving forward and continue to provide that for folks. So. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that that brings up a really good point of, you know, and you probably said this in your presentation that um, people who are very much in active use, it is recommended that they get treated for hepatitis C. Um, but for those that are in recovery as well, whatever recovery looks like for them, um, you know, we definitely understand too that may be the time that they really prioritize treatment for hepatitis C or prioritize vaccination. And so having entry points for those folks to um, mm -hmm. hepatitis care is great as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the Idaho Medicaid came in because um, Idaho Medicaid is, does a tremendous job where they've reduced the, all of those restrictions. So if, if you're a person and you're still um, using substances, we want you to get treated. We're not going to restrict you from getting treated. But however, other states, there's still those restrictions in place, unfortunately. And so 
Um, that's why I'm so proud of Idaho Medicaid and how hard they've worked to reduce all those restrictions. So. Danae, we have another question. Um, Tiffany asks, can you speak a little to the stigma surrounding hepatitis? Is it getting better? Um, Great question. I think that is a really good question. I think right now, so I was just in a meeting yesterday with our stakeholders and I had somebody from the local public health department um, join in on that meeting. And it was really a, a good meeting of trying to remind people that I don't necessarily know. I, I believe that there's still stigma, but I think really the thing right now is um, affordability and people being able, number one, to afford um, that. So if you're getting an antibody um, test, Okay, that's just going to say that if you have the antibodies in your blood, you might have cleared that infection a long time ago and you don't have that active virus, but you have to do a confirmatory testing to find out if you have that active virus in your system so that you can be possibly treated if you need to be treated. The problem that we're, just, we're experiencing right now in Idaho is that confirmatory testing is really expensive. So then there's people that or know that they have the antibodies, they're not sure if they have an active infection or not because they can't afford that confirmatory testing. So I think right now, um, what I'm hearing, right, that that's the biggest issue is that confirmatory testing. And then if you're not, um, you don't have Medicaid, that's can be another barrier because it can be expensive. However, our FQHCs, our community-based clinics have ability to use patient assistant programs where they can offer that treatment at little to no cost. So I don't know, Randy, what, if, what are you hearing around the state? Yeah, I think you've really touched on a lot of what, what I've heard. I just was thinking based upon what you were saying with confirmatory testing being so expensive is, I just wonder if there are some new test technologies for hepatitis C in particular on the horizon, even like um, you know, at home self testing, you know, blood spot testing, maybe just even cheaper laboratory testing. Have you heard anything about? Yeah, so that's, I believe that Kimberly, my supervisor, had heard that they do offer it. I want to say it's kind of like a point of care test. So it's like a blood, a finger test that can do. Um, find out if it's if it, you have that active infection. It's not just the antibody. I believe that they have that in other um, places like Australia. It just isn't approved here in the United States. So that number one might really help reduce the cost for people. But one thing that we were talking about, and, and this is just another thing for Idaho, what we can consider doing is Kimberly and I talked about working with Idaho Bureau of Laboratory. So maybe having some sort of partner in play, partnership in place, maybe we can utilize some of our funding. Um, so, and only offer this for people who absolutely can't afford testing, who aren't on Medicaid, because Medicaid covers that confirmatory testing. So maybe if there are people that um, are underinsured, um, aren't eligible for Medicaid, but they're not, they fall in that range where they, $109. Now that's at an FQHC. So we have an FQHC here in Idaho Falls that has contracted with a laboratory that they can get that confirmatory testing for $109. The problem with it is, is $109 can still be out of range for many people. Although they have that, um, that is kind of a set thing that they worked with the laboratory. It can be actually much more than $109, but they had it reduced down to $109. So that's actually good pricing, but for some people it's still out of range. So the thought is maybe those people, what if there's something like, this is something that Idaho could do, our Idaho prevention program, is we work out a deal with Idaho Bureau of Laboratories and we offer, um, it'd be kind of like maybe a subgrant type thing, but we could offer testing. So maybe people, um, that have patients that need that confirmatory testing, they could send it to Idaho Bureau of Laboratories at no cost to them or the patient. It would be free to them and the patient, but then they could get that confirmatory testing. So that's something that we're looking at. And after I had that meeting yesterday, I, that is something that we really want to, I, I want to continue to re go down that avenue for people because we had somebody from the health department say they get tests all the time that an antibody test was conducted there and they click no confirmatory testing done and reason um, cost patient can afford it. So at that point, it's really hard. So that's where I'd love to hear other states if they've had 
this similar thing? And um, how are you problem solving that? Because I think that's going to be the biggest problem for us to tackle um, receiving treatment because then I mean, hepatitis treatment is expensive, um, but they do have these patient assistant programs that can really help reduce that cost. We're not hearing a lot of feedback yeah. from other states that yeah. are having challenges with testing, but anything, anything else that folks want to pick Danae's brain on or share that is exciting that's happening um, in your organization or state around viral hepatitis? We'll give that a minute to marinate. Right, hearing none, I think we will kind of go ahead and wind down here. Thank you so much, Janae, for your passion and advocacy and sharing with us um, so much about viral hepatitis. And I just want to thank all of you for joining us today to um, learn a little bit more about this health topic and recovery. And as a reminder, recording and slides from today will be on the Northwest ATTC website shortly. And if you attended the live session today, we'll be sending out a survey to request your feedback and a certificate that you can use to obtain continuing education credits. And certainly encourage you to join us tomorrow for part four. We'll be talking about smoking cessation. Um, so tomorrow, Thursday, September 15th at noon mountain time, we will meet here again. And to uh, get the link, just register on the ATTC website. So. Thank you all for joining us. I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.